let's jump uh, into the scripture for today. I'm going to give you a verse, then my title, and we're going to jump in. Today, I'm so excited, and I'm sitting down because today, um, I want to teach today. Uh, I believe that as humans, some things are taught and some things are caught. And today is a teaching. Today's topic is so important that I don't want you to miss out on not what I have to say, but what God has to say. So I prepped, I have my notes. So today I'm like, I want to look at my notes. I usually don't, but today I am. So I'm sitting down because, because you're sitting down and it's only fair. You know what I mean? Like, why am I the only one getting tired on Sundays? Um, so let's read this verse. Uh, we're reading out of John chapter 8, verse 44. John 8, 44, and this is what the Bible says. It says, he has always hated the truth. We're talking about Satan. We're talking about the wicked one. We're talking about the liar. We're talking about the devil. We're talking about your ex, however you call him. We're talking about the enemy, okay? This is what the Bible says. Now, Satan has always hated the truth because there is no truth in him. And when he lies, it is consistent with his character. For he is a liar and the father of lies. Such, a, such an important thing for us to understand that Satan, the enemy, is his character is a lie. There is no truth in him. He cannot speak truth. And can I tell you, the enemy is always speaking at you. So if there is a voice in the back of your mind in this season of the enemy telling you, you're going to fail, you're not going to make it, it will crash and burn, there will not be freedom, there won't be success, can I tell you, that's the enemy. And the fact that he is telling you that you're not going to make it means that you are because he cannot give you a truth. So I'm so encouraged every time I hear the devil tell me, Abe, it's over, you had a good run and you're going to fail. I'm like, thank you, Satan, for reminding me that this is just a valley, and if God brought me here, he's gonna, get me, he's gonna bring me through. So I'm encouraged, I'm so encouraged. So if that's you right now, you're in that season where you're like, devil, get behind me. No, just, let's just repurpose that and say, you know what? Yeah, I am gonna make it. That's why I'm facing all this opposition. Today, let me give you my title, um, and we're gonna go from here. Before I give you my title, today we're talking, we're having the money talk. Oh, no. Why did I bring a friend today? I know. Bring him next week. Today we're talking about money. Let me tell you why. There's, there's, a, there's two topics that the church usually doesn't like to talk about. Sex and money. You know where our world is failing right now? In sex and money. We suck. Because it's taboo. We don't like to talk about it. But can I tell you, the world loves to talk about it. And um, we need to get a vision for our money. Because Amazon has a vision for your money. Every ad I get has a vision for my money. It's almost like they hear me, and they do. <laughs> and I'm talking about a new vacuum cleaner, and I get like 10 ads. Because they have a vision for my money. Can I tell you, God has a vision for your money as well. And whatever area of your life you don't have a vision for, you will perish. As the Bible says, people perish because of a lack of vision. When you don't have a vision for your marriage, your marriage will fail. When you don't have a vision for your children, your children will fail. When you don't have a vision for your, for your mental health, your mental health will fail. When you don't have a vision for your finances, you will fail financially. But when we catch a vision, let me tell you, everything comes together. There is clarity, and you're able to find life. So today, we're going to have the money talk. I do like twice a year, so don't be like, oh my God, that church always talk about money. Shut up. No, we don't. <laughs> um... But it's important. It's in this book. It's in the Bible. So we're going to... Are you guys excited for it? Yeah. Come on. Daylight, Daylight Savings Day. You made it. And I pray that you... Uh, that today you... you, you or this week you, you, you run into some free money. Like, you know, someone leaves a 20 at the ATM or whatever. You'll be like, oh, pastor was right. Yeah. <laughs> today my title is The Lies We're Told About Money. The Lies We're Told About Money. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we thank you for this moment that you, that you have created for us, Lord. Sometimes we, we even give ourselves credit for coming to church, but we know that it was your spirit that pulled us out of bed this morning with an hour less, Lord. But still, I pray right now for every family represented that they will find rest this week. I pray that this morning as we dive into this topic, um, that you would give us clarity, that we will receive from you. Make it clear to us, Lord, that the enemy is a liar 
and he's speaking lies, but we want to hear from you. We want to receive your truth about this topic that is so important. So Holy Spirit, we, 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 we clear out our minds and our spirits to receive from you. We thank you for the person to our left and to our right. May you keep them. May you bless them, Lord. Cover them. We pray for healing, restoration, and breakthroughs in their life. And we thank you for this moment in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody says, amen. Clap one more time because this is good. Um, so let's dive right into it. The lies that we are told about money. We're having the money talk, people. We went and we saw all your uh, credit scores, so we're going to talk about it. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, we, we saw in the book of John, Satan is a liar. The devil is a liar. And can I tell you, he is always speaking. And every time Satan speaks, he speaks a lie over your life. And Satan, the enemy, the wicked one, he is always speaking to you. Now, us as Christians, us as humans, it is our responsibility to do two things. Number one, we have to reject the lies. Every single day, you have an option to take on the lies or to reject the lies. Can I tell you, Christianity is not a one and done decision. Some of us were saying, oh my God, I've been a Christian for 10 years. No, you prayed a prayer 10 years ago and you kept living very worldly for the next 10 years. Christianity is not a one-time decision. It is a moment-by-moment -moment decision. You have an option. There's a big difference in between receiving Jesus as your Lord and Savior and being a Christian. There's a big difference between paying every week for a gym membership and actually working out. Can I get an amen? It's a big difference. Okay? Being at the gym doesn't make you fit. Being in the church doesn't make you a Christian. Being at Dunkin' Donuts doesn't make you a donut. It is not about the one-time decision. It is about every single decision that you make. You have a choice. When your spouse tells you something you don't like, am I going to respond in my flesh or in my spirit? Okay? When you wake up on Sundays and you have a choice to sleep in or wake up, am I going to listen to my flesh or am I going to listen to the spirit? So we have to, number one, reject the lies. But number two, we have to invite the truth. Now, a lot of us, we don't think it's a big deal to listen to lies. And, and can I tell you, lies are comfortable. You know, some of you, maybe all of us, heard a lie this morning. I even got to go to church today. And can I tell you, I thought that was Jesus. Because he was comfortable. The blankets were warm this morning. I turned on YouTube. There's all these cool videos by my favorite creators. I'm like, oh my God, the Lord is telling me that Abraham GM should preach today. It is a difficult conversation. Guys, it's a difficult conversation. Some of you, like we posted, uh, if you follow us on social, which you should, we said, hey, we're talking about money. People are like, oh my God, I don't need this one. Because I don't need people telling me about my money. Uh, you didn't come to hear what I have to say. You came to hear what the Holy Spirit is here to tell you. It's not about, you, you shouldn't mo model your finances based on Crystal and I's life. You should model your finances based on what the Bible says about money. And how will you do that if you don't know what it says? Can I get an amen? amen. We're, we're, we're teaching today. So you have to reject the lies, but how do you know which one is a lie? Have you ever felt like there's a voice in the back of your mind speaking to you? I want you to, I want you to do this in your, in your spirit. I want you to remember my words right now. Every time you hear that voice, it's not your conscience, okay? It is a voice. It's either God, the enemy, or you. Every time you hear a voice, every morning, and you hear it throughout the day, Every time someone cuts you off in traffic, every time your manager says something dumb, every time a friend hits you up to go out, every time you're with your family and they talk about your weight, can I get an amen? Every time someone says anything, there's going to be a voice that triggers you and causes an action. And you have to ask yourself these three questions. Is that God? Is that the enemy? Or is that me? Now, let me tell you, um, every time uh, I, it sounds comfortable, um, I think it's God because I want to think that God thinks like me, but it's usually me. Now, it's kind of easy to know um, when the devil's speaking to you because he speaks to you to make decisions that are selfish. You know it's the enemy because he'll ask you to do things that will cause you to separate yourself from community and go into isolation because he never goes after the weakest, he goes after the loneliest. So you know it's the devil because he'll cause you to be comfortable. He'll cause you to be selfish. He'll cause you to be angry. He'll cause you to react and not respond. But how do you know if it's God or if it's you? Let me tell you, it's God when it's not only going to bless you, but it's going to bless people around you. 
God is not a selfish God. God will never ask you to take and not give. God will never ask you to do things that benefit you but hurt other people. So you always have to ask yourself the question, how do I know it's God? Well, first of all, is it in accordance with what the Bible says? Now, the word says that the Bible never changes, but there's fresh revelation every single day. So every time God asks you or you think, God's speaking to me, is it in accordance with his word or is it just the quesadillas you ate last night? So a lot of people are like, God told me to date you. Oh, that's not in the Bible. That's not prophesying. That's prophesying. You know what I'm saying? So a lot of people are like, God told me you're the one. Uh, shut up. You're wrong. You're just thirsty. You need some holy water. So you got to ask yourself right now, and a lot of you, as it comes to your finances, is it God telling you? Is it the devil telling you? Or is it you telling yourself? So today I want to teach you about how to reject the lies. Um, I, I, I want to speak on this because Jesus spoke on this. I found out some great things about how much Jesus actually spoke about money. 15%, 15% of everything that Jesus taught was about money. Isn't that crazy? More than leadership, he spoke about money. 11 out of the 39 parables are about money. 11 out of the 39 parables, like the stories that we hear is Jesus speaking about money. And then I ask myself the question, why does God care about money so much? Can I tell you he doesn't? He cares about your heart. This is why Jesus speaks about money all the time. Because your money is not about your hand. It's not about your hands. It's about your heart. He knows that if we are not able to trust God with our money, we're not able to trust him because Jesus is either Lord of all or of nothing at all. So Jesus talks about money. Why? Because money is such a comfort for us. Money is such a drug for us. Money is our measure of success. We want it, and if we don't have it, we want to get it. And if we have a lot, we think that we're special. But Jesus says money is a horrible God. And he wants to bring in some wisdom about our money. Can I tell you this? Money is a great servant, but a horrible God. We need to be able to master our money before our money masters us. Are you making decisions based on your need right now? Are you saying yes to opportunities based on your need, based on your desperation? Making decisions based out of your financial failure is like going to the grocery store when you're starving. Have you ever been there? You're like, I need that, I need that. Uh, no, you don't, you need to go on keto. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, keto or taquito, Lord? Anyways. <laughs> Dad jokes. I'm on taquito right now. <laughs> I'll get on keto later. Taquitos right now. <laughs> Same thing with our finances. You see, when we are starving financially, we make, we make irresponsible decisions. The Bible says in Matthew 6, 6 24, seeks historically, you see, daylight savings. Matthew 6 24, the Bible says this No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon. Mammon, what a word. Have you heard about mammon? Mammon is the spirit of money. There is a spirit of God, and then there's a spirit of money. It's called mammon in the Bible. Mammon is the spirit. If you translate mammon, it's translate to riches. Now, your money has a spirit. And you get to pick and decide what spirit your money has. Your money either has the spirit of God on it or the spirit of mammon on it. You're, this is what the spirit of mammon does. Mammon will tell you this. Money is so valuable and it will give you an unquenchable thirst for more money that even if you have a lot, it will never be enough. Have you ever been there? You finally have the money that you always wanted and all of a sudden it's not enough because you have the spirit of mammon in it. Because you're like, oh my God, I need more. Money is where I, do, I get my value from. Money is where I get my significance from. Money is where I get my acceptance from. And when you put the spirit of mammon on it, you reject the spirit of God and all of a sudden, even having a lot, it's never enough. Mammon is translated to riches. So the goal is not to reject this lie so that we can fall out of love with money, let me tell you, God, money is not the source of your life. It's just a resource to build a great life. So I want you to understand this. Money is not bad. Money is good. Money is a great thing. 
I, I want more of it. <laughs> I know you want more of it. The question is this. I want money that has the Spirit of God on it, not the Spirit of mammon on it. Why? Because I want to be blessed to be a blessing. And I'm not just talking about the church. I'm talking about your family. Let me tell you, um, um, money is not um, the goal of life. And this is something that I learned a long time ago that changed my life. Money is not the greatest blessing, but it allows you to enjoy your greatest blessing, which is your family. A lot of us were like, I don't need money. I got friends. Well, yeah, but you can either be with your friends at Taco Bell, okay, or, or go with your friends to Cabo and have a better time. I'm not saying that Taco Bell is bad because I'm going to get some today. In Jesus' name, I love me some Taco Bell on Sundays. <laughs> but can I tell you, it is about what takes priority on your life. Money is not the greatest blessing. Money just allows you to enjoy the greatest blessings of your life. Money allows you to create opportunities for people. Money allows you to create connection with people. Every time you go into a small business and you bless and you build community. When you give through the church, we create community. Every time you give to pay for your rent, someone gets blessed and someone gets blessed. Money is not a curse, but when you have it in the wrong order of your life, what is meant to be a blessing can become a curse. So we got to be careful. So today, I'm going to give you three lies that we've been told about money. Are you ready? The first lie that I want you to really pay attention to is this. The more money I have, the more money, the more value and happiness I have. This is a lie that we've been told by culture, by friends, by family, that the more money I have, the more money and value, the more value and happiness that I have. Now, this is how I know that money is a, that is, is a factor on your self-esteem. Um, have you ever felt um, a little embarrassed about leaving your car in the valet at a nice restaurant? Okay, just me, because you all have really nice cars, I get it. Back in the day, I remember I was invited to um, a, a, a dinner and I show up and sometimes when your car is not like the car, you're like, I'll park in the corner, but they're like, yo, just grab the valet. And you're like, bruh, <laughs> I don't want to do that to the valet guy, you know what I'm saying? Because, like, my, my car right now is not, like, the best representation of my future. You know what I'm saying? Like, I forgot to go through, like, the car wash today. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's just, it just doesn't represent me too well. Like, I spent all my money on the shoes, not necessarily on the armor all. You know what I'm saying? And, like, you show up to the valet guy. And, like, have you ever had to explain your car situation to the valet guy? Like, bro, it's, just, it's in between drive and neutral. You, you'll find it, though. Like, you'll find it. Like, just, just like, like, it, it, like, you have to really, like, jimmy it. Just jimmy it. Jimmy? Just jimmy, jimmy it. And because we feel like it hits our self-esteem. Can I be honest? Like, maybe you're not going to admit that today, but, like, this is, like, this is a therapy Sunday for me. Sometimes you'll show up and you'll see people that just look like they got money. Have you ever seen people and they just look like money? You're like, yeah, they got money. Yeah, we got to be friends. You know what I'm saying? Now, don't really befriend them because there are people that really have money don't look like it. You know what I'm saying? But there's some people that just look like money, and sometimes we, like, put ourselves down a little bit. Because why? We believe that money equals value. That the more money I have, people will see me differently. That the more money I have, when I go to the store, man, people are going to approach me. Sometimes I go to the store, and people don't even come and ask me if I need help. I go to Nordstrom's, and I get mad. I tell Crystal, I shut up, and I'm like, are they being racist? I showed up and I'm like, I'm ready to buy me some shoes. And everyone's just staring at me like, oh, the cleaning guy's here. You know what I'm saying? It's like, bro. <laughs> it hits my self-esteem. That's the spirit of mammon. That makes you think that your value comes from what you look like and the money that you have or that you do not have. I've, I know people that are so rich but are so empty. Or I know people that have so much money and they're still, hey, pastor, like, I just, my marriage... My kids, can I tell you, money doesn't make you happy. Money doesn't solve problems. But then again, I, I know people that have no money, they got so much joy. Now, you could say this, oh my God, like, of course they don't, they, they don't have any problems. They don't have money. Money, more money, more problems, as the Bible says. No, 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 no. It's, sometimes the people that accrue so much money, can I tell you, there's nothing wrong with having money as long as money doesn't have you. It's a big difference. We stress out. We stress out so much. I'm glad that you have so much money in your bank account, but some of you are so stressed out that you don't want to lose it, so you're not enjoying life. You're keeping yourself from being happy. 
Because your value is attached to the figure that you see on your bank account when you open up that app. And if that continues to go down, it's an issue for you. And you realize that your value is not connected to this thing. I remember for years, I would go once a year to a mission trip down in Mexico. And I would see people with homes built from cardboard boxes. You've seen them? And the tarps. And they have no floor. It's just dirt. And they're having the best time of their life. Because joy is free. Because the, the, the true riches of life are the things that money cannot buy. Can I tell you, no amount of money in your bank account will give you peace. No amount of money in your bank account will give you hope, will give you desires. You don't need money to dream, you just need faith. You don't need money for your marriage to come together. No, you just need an understanding in the Spirit of God in your life. Because money is not where we get our value from. And it doesn't matter what you have or you do not have because joy is a decision that you make in your heart. It's an inside job. Proverbs 30, 8 and 9, the Bible says this. First, help me never to tell a lie. Second, give me neither poverty nor riches. I love this. Give me just enough to satisfy my needs. For if I grow rich, I may deny you and say, who is the Lord? And if I'm too poor, I may steal and thus insult God's holy name. This is a great verse because it talks about dependence on God. Let me explain to you what that means. The, 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 the writer of this proverb, which proverb is the book of wisdom, says, God, don't give me too much. Because sometimes when we get too much resource, we forget about the source. Sometimes we think that, that, that our income is so good, it, it has to do with how good we are. And, and, and yeah, no, I get it. But like, it's my gift. It's my talent. Who gave you your gift and talent? It all comes from the source. And sometimes we forget that how good we are is also a gift from God. That God made you from the moment you were born. And we think like, oh man, well, I got this promotion and God's not really involved with my income. Therefore, I don't give. Can I tell you, let us not forget where it comes from. Because what we don't celebrate, we eventually lose. What doesn't turn into praise will eventually turn into pride. And God opposes the proud. See, this is, what, this is what's wild. For me, worship is a catch and release thing. Every time someone comes and, have you, ever, have you ever met someone that gives you a compliment and you just like drink it up because it feels good? It's like, oh my God, like, dude, like the way, you know, the way you live your life is so inspiring. And you're like, yeah, man, I'm kind of a big deal. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it is what it is. People have always told me that. It is what it is. People will come all the time, and you guys are so kind and encouraging. We have the most encouraging church, I believe, in all of San Diego. I make these, like, big statements all the time. Like, we're the best church. I love it. No, I love it. And people be like, yo, pastor, like, this message is so good. It can be like, um, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> can I say? <laughs> I'm gifted like that. No, 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 no. What doesn't turn into praise immediately will turn into pride. Pride becomes, pride becomes this weight that keeps you down. Pride is this thing that like you, you drink too much of it and you get like this food poisoning. It poisons you in the bad way. Nobody wants to be friends with a prideful person. I'm not saying not to be proud. You should be proud of the work that you do. You should be proud of the excellence in your life. You should be proud of the life that you've accomplished, of the home and the peace and the joy and the marriage and the children. and the fine. You should be proud and grateful, but give the praise where it's due and it's with God. And it's like, God, don't allow me to have too much that I forget. But I love what it says. Yo, don't make me be so poor that I'm tempted to go to 7-Eleven and like rob this thing. You know what I'm saying? True story, I'm not going to say any names. I had a buddy back in, back in the day that worked at 7-Eleven. He's like, yo, yo, Abe, like, um, we're insured. You know that? I was like, what does that mean? He's like, dude, you show up, like, fake punch me, I'll give you the cash, and we both good. And then I say, oh, my bro, you forgot I'm a pastor? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's just, I'm like, okay, but let's tithe on it. No, I'm just kidding. No, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. You'll never know. Just kidding. Delete that from the tape. No, no, no. Let, it, let me not be so poor, God. Let me just get enough what I need. He says, don't give me too much because I don't trust myself with too much. 
Some of us get in trouble because we have too much. He says, don't give me enough because I don't trust myself when I'm in lack. Because when you're desperate, you'll settle for crumbs. When you're desperate, you'll settle for relationships because they always buy and they always invite. And you become and you put people on a platform. It's called idolatry. You, you, you begin to set people up for failure when you put them on a platform and you think that they are the source of your happiness. We do this with relationships all the time. You're setting up your spouse, your significant other, or your close friends for failure when you think that they are the source of your joy. Oh, my God, ever since I met her, like, my life is just better. No, 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 no. God brought that person into your life because no one can give you joy, but everyone's called to you so that you can enjoy the joy that God gives you. My wife is not responsible for my happiness. I'm not responsible for, her, for happiness. We are responsible to steward each other's happiness and enjoy the happiness together. So when you reject the spirit of mammon and say, okay, God, I don't want too much. I don't want enough. Let me tell you, we, we reject the spirit of mammon and we invite the spirit of Jesus. The more money I have, the more value and happiness I have. Can I tell you that is a lie? Money cannot buy you happiness. Money cannot buy you value. The spirit of God is what brings you happiness and value. Can I get an amen? amen. The second lie I want you to watch out is simply this. All my money is mine. So I must hold on so I don't miss out. We've all thought of this. My money is mine. All of it. I worked for it. I earned it. I worked hard for it. This is me. This is, I, this is me. I created this wealth. I'm a self-made man. Okay, like you gave birth to yourself. Like you just like fell off from this like banana tree and all of a sudden you're like the banana guy. You know what I'm saying? Like, no. There's no such thing as a self-made person. If, if a parent figure, if a grandpa once said, mijo, you got this, you're not a self-made person. There's no such thing. There's no such thing. The money is mine, so I must hold on so I don't miss out. We live in a culture of keeping up with the Joneses. If you remember this statement, back in the day, you would compare yourself to the people in your cul-de-sac. I come from a time where still before social media, before the cell phones, and, and I remember my, my parents um, would look at the neighbors, and when they got a new car, we would get a new car. When they would paint their house, we would try to paint our house. When they got a dog, we got two dogs. It was a thing. It was always a battle. And there was like five people in your street that you were always in competition with. Oh, you see what they're doing? Oh, they installed lights? We're installing lights. They put the Christmas lights, we're going to do better. But now we live in a generation where you can just compare with the people in your street. You compare with everybody on your Instagram and TikTok. And now it's thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people. And we're trying to keep up. Can I tell you it's impossible? So you know what you and I do? We get FOMO. FOMO is, oh my God, they went to church and then they went to brunch. We're going to do that too. And here's the problem. Some of you are comparing yourself with people that are not on your tax bracket. Can we just start there? You're suffering because they got the shoes that you want, and now you're going to spend all your money in that using what I call FOMO insurance. Some of you got FOMO insurance. FOMO insurance is the money that you do not use wisely just in case your friends want to do that Cabo trip because they can afford it, but you can't, so you're hoarding all of these uh, resources just to keep up. It's happened to all of us. All your friends start getting engaged, now you're trying to buy a ring. Can't afford a ring. Can't even afford, you know what I'm saying? What are you doing? What are you doing? Spend money and like, you're not gonna pay your car. Everyone's getting a new car, now you're out there buying a new car that you can't afford because you're just trying to keep up. And you say, well, all my money is mine, so I can do whatever I want with it. That is a life from the pit of hell. We become enslaved to it because we say things like this. If it's for me, it's up to me. Have you ever said that before? Like, you know God called you to live a great life? Someone says, oh, my God, I see greatness in your life. You, got, you, you, you have a vision to have a great marriage. You have a vision to buy a home. And you're like, well, if it's for me, it's up to me. So you begin to hoard all of your finances and you stop giving and you stop the, the cycle of generosity because you think if life is going to be successful, it's 100% up to you. And you take God off of the equation. 
And when you remove God of the equation of your finances, can I tell you, when you close the door for God in one area, you ask him to step out of all the other areas of your life. Now you have some good money, but some broken family relationships. Now your bank account is full, but your character is bankrupt. God's like, I'm either in your house or I'm not. God, I want you in this area. I want you to help me lose weight, but I don't want you to touch my money. I want you to help me with anxiety, but I don't want you to touch my savings. God says, I'm either Lord of all or not at all. So how do we get out of this lie? That, that, that the money is mine and I got to do this. Is, this is the thought, and I want you to write this down. I got to stop living like an owner and start living like a steward. You got to stop living like an owner and start living like a steward. I do that with my kids all the time. When, when tigers start going crazy, I'm like, that's your kid, God. You figure it out. Do you know what I mean? I'm like, I know I'm stewarding my children, but they're your children. Aren't we all ch children of God? Sometimes I think about, oh, my God, like I wanted to go to a good college. And sometimes you'll begin to stress out when I, rem when I remind myself, oh, that's God's child. God, you will figure it out. I don't have to stress. My car? Oh, that's not my car. That's God's car. Now, you can think it's your car. If it's, and if it's yours... It's all up to you. You know what? You know, Crystal and I, when we, when we took on this building to start a church, this church started from on social media on YouTube. Usually churches start and they meet at a house, at a coffee shop, at a school, boys and girls. We came downtown into this beautiful thing. Why? Because we said, this, this is God's church. God's vision, God's provision. If I said, this is my house, this is my church, a little pop-up sign of me over there like, meet Pastor Abe. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> then, it's, then it's up to me. But this ain't my church. I don't worry about the, the finances of this church because this is God's church. God, God will figure it out. So I don't live like an owner. Everything in my life, my marriage, I don't say uh, it's up to me to fix. Can I tell you, God has never healed a marriage. He heals people that then go heal their marriage. Why? Because it's up to him. It's up to him. You don't have to make it happen. Just give it to God. You can't pay the bills this month. Don't... Where do I got to go and two hustles and three hustles and after have to sit. No, 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 no. Just give it to God. Just trust him. It's okay, God. This is yours. Some of you have been fighting in your living situation for the past three years because it's your house. How about you just give it to God today? Go to your apartment today, your little studio. I remember our, our, our first studio here. We paid way too much for a no-room studio here downtown. And we go into our no-room having studio. And we're like, Lord, we can't afford this. But you say, you say, God, we give you my little studio. I give you my little space. I give it to you. And he took care of it. I'm not an owner. I'm a steward. Malachi 3.10. So the Bible says, will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you ask, how do we rob you? In tithes and offerings. Let's have the uncomfortable conversation right now. Let's just talk about this. Thieves asking. Well, let's talk about it. Because either the whole Bible is true or the whole Bible is a lie. You can't pick and choose. The same Bible that we're like, well, God forgive my sins, I'm a new creation. The same Bible that says, you're robbing me of my tithes and offerings. This is why we only, I'm looking at my wife now. Babe, this is, I was about to wimp out this week. I told Crystal on Tuesday, babe, I don't think we're ready for the money talk. And she said, man up, fool. I said, all right, let's go. Let's have it. I'm here to serve you guys. Hey, I, I heard this once, and I took it. I was ready to be coachable. Okay, there's a, there's a big difference between coachable and agreeable. When you're agreeable, you just say yes to the things that you want to say yes to. When you're coachable, you're like, I'll do the things that are hard, because when we do the things that are hard, then there is growth. You get a trainer and, and say, 10 more, and you say, nope. <laughs> okay, no, you get no results. Okay, today, pray for a spirit of coachability. Just be open to this. The Bible says this, you're robbing me. How? Tithes and offerings. Okay, let me explain to you. Okay, what is the tithe? Because you hear about that. What's the tithe? Okay, tithe means 10%. Now, you got to think of this. In the time where this scripture was, was, was written, it's a time of agriculture. Let me tell you where culturally the tithe was created. There were people that had fields in their home. Widows, families had fields, and they, they, they didn't know what to do with. Back then, people would own a mountain, would own a land. It would, it would just be how it was. Now, a person would come, 
a business owner, a farmer could come and go to, go to a person and say, hey, you own a field, but you're not working it. How about I work your field? You give me your land that you're not doing anything with, and of everything I produce, I will give you 10%. Can I tell you, the job that you have belongs to God. God allows you to work it, therefore you give him 10% back. Let, let me explain this culturally. Every time we go to work, every time we buy a home, every time we rent a house, every time we buy a car, every time we start a hustle, we start an Etsy, you put up a stand and sell some lemonade, that is you saying, God, I believe that everything in this world is yours. All the resource, all the land, all of the opportunities, there, I don't have any land because I'm not an owner. I'm a steward. But if you will give me access into this company that is yours, and you allow me to work in this thing that I recognize is yours, then I believe it is my due diligence to give you 10% for allow me to work in a company that I didn't create, for allow me to work in a space that I don't deserve. So we give the 10% back to him. That's how culturally it started. Did that make sense? Your job, your hustle, your online store, whatever that you do, this is what they would do. They will go into a space that you didn't create. You didn't create your life. You didn't create San Diego. You didn't create your building. You didn't create your hustle. God allows you to work it, and it says now, culturally and spiritually, we give 10% back to you. Let me give you two, two thoughts on the, on the tithe, and I want you to write this down because this is good for, this is teaching. This is class, and if you take notes, you get VIP in heaven. Come on. Two things about the tithe that I don't want you to forget. And I, and I want to, I don't, when I go to Jesus, I don't want to be responsible that I never taught you these things about tithing and that I'm keeping a blessing from your life. The first thing I want you to know about the tithe is the tithing is not just a percentage, it's an order. What's the tithe, Pastor? The 10%? Wrong. It's the first 10%. It's not just 10% of your income in case there's 10% left over. No, 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 no. The tithe, the Bible says, give me the first 10%. What does that mean to me? Payday? Tithe day. That's, that's how I remember it. For me, tithe day and payday is the same thing. When I, it's funny. Once you do it two or three times, oh, the moment I get a, a paycheck, in my mind, the first thing I think is tithe. I'm like, tithe. And, and, and thank God we live in a digital era that I don't have to hold it in my pocket till Sunday. You can give on push pay. <laughs> you can give online. Payday is tithe day. It's an order. Now, the tithe means the tenth, right? It comes from the word of tenth. And what we can do often is give the 10% any time of the month, and we think that we tithe. That is not a tithe. When you give it at the end of everything, that's not a tithe. The Bible teaches that the tithe is the first 10%. Payday is tithe day. Why is there an order to the tithe? Because God doesn't like being second. Let me teach you this about God, because every Sunday you come and you're like, I love that church because they, they preach that chill Jesus. Oh, that Jesus is so cool and so nice. Yes, but he's also God, and he's also a king, and he's also the Lord, and he's also the one that says something and things happen. And let me tell you about that God. He doesn't like being second. Everything we put first, he destroys. Try it. Put anything as an idol, you're dooming them to fail. Place your job as an idol. This is what I've learned. I worked for a company for 13 years. And then I got a text on a Thursday and say, you're out. You know what I learned after 30? I thought everything was set for me. I'm like, I'm good for life. This is what I learned. Whoever can give you a check has the power to take it away. And then I repented to God. I'm sorry, God, that my loyalty was to a person signing the check, not the one that holds the whole universe in order. I was like, good Lord. It is an order. God checked me. God checked me. He says, now your trust was in a man. And never expect from a man what only God can give you. And can I tell you, now I get this money and, and I have freedom and I have peace. And I will never again not remind myself that payday is tied there. I don't want that to happen again. I don't want to believe. And I work for, for a company. And, but I know that it's not the company that pays me. I believe that God uses that company to give me what he needs to give me. The hours that I get, the money that I get. So tight day, pay day. Push pay, let's go, let's go. The second thing I want you to know about the tithe is that tithing is giving my best 
So I stretch my faith for the rest. I'm going to say that again. Tithing is giving my best so that I stretch my faith for the rest. Now, why is it about the first 10%? Why, why does this matter? Because many of us give the 10% at the end of the month once we've covered everything we need to cover. We're like, okay, I got paid. I got to pay the bills. And it always starts with, I got to, right? Got to pay the bills. Like, we ain't got to take care of God. We, we ain't got to do that, but I got to pay this bill because I, I need my Wi-Fi. You know what I'm saying? Got to pay the internet. Got to pay the rent. I got to pay the car. And if there's left over, I'll give it to Jesus. That's, that's, that's not tithe. That's charity. That's not tithe. That's charity. Um, how would you feel, you know, I come in with, my, with, with my, my, my bag of chips. I love chips. I don't know why I said chips. Bag of chips. Hey, pastor, can I have one? Um, let me just eat till I'm done. And if there's any leftover, I'll give you one. You'd be like, ah, oh, no, forget you. We're no longer friends. That's how we treat God sometimes. We, but, but, but God forbid, he forbid, he told us that, right? Hey, God, you know what? Like, there's, I'm, not, I'm not feeling well. I just need some peace. Well, let me bless these 10 people, and if I got any peace left over, let, let me circle back. Let me see if I got anything left over. Like, dang, that's tough. That's absolutely tough. We want God to have our leftovers and not our best. You know what? Let me, let me tell you why he wants to be first. Because he wants your first and best, and once you've given your best, he gives you faith for the rest. I know it's a play on words, Dr. Seuss, but let me explain this to you. Tithing is about faith, not about generosity. Let, let me explain this to you. When you, when, you give, when, you, when you get your paycheck and you have that little bit of money, right, and you're like, you feel like, isn't it funny how money affects our, 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 our mood? And the day before payday, you're like, oh, I'm not in the mood for anything. Payday, you're like, yo, who's trying to chill tonight? You know what I'm saying? Like, you feel happier. You forgive everybody. I forgive you today. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's just like, don't lie. It's not just me. The day before payday, I'm like, oh, I'm not feeling good. Payday is like tacos. You know what I mean? Like, in my, in my family, we do that. Let's go get some tacos. I teach my kids now. They know that payday is tight day, taco day. All teas. All teas. This is why it's first. When it comes, I say, this first tenth is God's. I give it to God. And then I live my life. Then I do everything. I pay the bills. We go get some food. We, 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 we pay everything that we got to do. And if at the end, here's the crazy thing that happens. It's all about faith. Towards the end, there's always one bill that like I'm struggling to pay. And you know what I do? I go back to God. God will use my need to force me and remind me of my dependence on him. And I get to go back and say, God, you said it. That if I trusted you, you would take care of it. And can I tell you time and time again, he always comes through. It's almost like a faith thing because he makes me trust him first so that I can live my life. And at the end of the month, when there's a need or something that I want to do, I don't say, well, I got it. No, I say, God, you got this. And I'm able to trust them wholly. Now, let me tell you this thing about the tithe. Tithe. It's about faith, not generosity, because your tithe does not belong to you. The tithe belongs to God. A lot of us think that we should be blessed because we tithe. And uh, that's not where it starts. You're like, okay, pastor, you're not making any sense. Okay, let me, let me, let me explain this to you. Um, giving money back to someone who let you borrow it doesn't mean they're going to pay you back. You're just paying back a debt. So if, if you let me borrow 20 bucks... And in a month, I give you back the 20 bucks. I'm not like, yo, now you got to pay me back. It's like, no, like this was mine to begin with. Can I tell you, tithing is not about generosity. You don't get a blessing on generosity out of tithing. We're supposed to tithe. It belongs to him already. It is when we are generous that we begin to sow seed. It's, it's so wild how in the New Testament, generosity starts after the tithe. It starts. Tithing is just something that is like the lowest bar. It's the lowest level. It's the lowest, the, the lowest level of generosity, of, of, of sacrifice, is tithing. You know how you know you're being generous when it starts to hurt right here? Oh, this, this is how I feel my whole life. The tithe, I don't think about it. I don't think I'm being a good Christian because I tithe. I'm supposed to tithe. 
It belongs to him. I have life. He gives me land to work. I go to work every day. I'm like, God, you gave me this. I'm going to give you the 10% back. It belongs to you. It is what it is. But then, if I really want to be generous, I'm like, from what is mine, I get to give now. And then I, be- and then I begin to see my life completely change. Because when I give to God, it's just, it's just God. But when I give to others, when I give above and beyond, let me tell you, we begin to see the fruits of generosity. You can only do two things with your tithe. You can give it or you can steal it. That's it. That's it. Like paying your rent, you can either pay your rent or, you know, get evicted. You can't just say, I'm saving the rent and I'm going to pay you in six months like the whole lump sum. No, 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 absolutely not. It's his. So I want to be a, a husband. I want to be a man. I want to be a father that I want it to be known from this verse that I'm not robbing God. That God doesn't need my 10%. This is about me reminding myself I depend on him. That everything I have is his. And I want him to continue to keep an open heaven over my life. It's not out of fear, guys. It is, a, a tithe is not us escaping a curse. It's being invited to a blessing. Can I get an amen? amen. And I'll finish with this. We'll get the key so you guys can, like, chill out for a second. I told you. Now, we're having the money talk today. Might as well just commit. The last lie that we believe is that if we don't have any money by now, you'll never have it. That's how we believe sometimes, right? If I wasn't born with money, like, oh, at my age, if I don't have it, uh, this is just me forever. That's a lie from God. That's a lie from the devil. Uh, If I don't have money, some people are just born with it. Some people just inherit it. People like us. Have you ever said people like us? Have you ever, like, looked back in your life and realized that you grew up poor and that, 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 that there was hot dog buns, but your mom was using slices of bread, and you're like, gosh, wow, we were poor. I guess we're supposed to be poor. That's a lie. That's a lie. We've been taught that those who have it, have it, and those who don't, don't. No, 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 no. Your family and their legacy is not the source of money. God is the source of all the money. And, I don't, and I'm not just saying Blessings. Blessings is everything. I'm talking about money today. Next week, I'm talking about everything else. And you guys will probably be more energetic, and I'll stand up. And yeah. But today, I really want to help you understand this. God is the source of all the money. I'm not just saying blessings. That too, money. There's this prayer that maybe you've heard. It's called the Lord's Prayer. And it is one of the fundamental prayers. And, and, and there is this key component that it says, give us today our daily bread. Have you heard about that before? Maybe you never heard the Lord's Prayer. It's a prayer when the disciples ask Jesus, Jesus, how should we pray? Jesus gives them exactly a prayer. I, I, I memorized that prayer when I was a little kid in Spanish. Like every night my parents would make me recite it. it. became this like religious thing. So I'll never forget the daily bread. And I would always picture like a loaf of bread. I'm like, God, give me bread. <laughs> now, we, when this verse was written, the, 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 the daily bread, it was an agricultural era. It was about sowing and reaping. So everything the Bible says, it's so carefully crafted. It says what it means, and it means what it says. I'm so surprised that it doesn't say, give us today our daily fruit, because it all started with fruit. Give us today our daily fruit. Fruit grows everywhere. You can go to any island, and without any man intervention, you can discover a whole new continent. You know what you're going to find? You're going to find some fruit, because fruit's just there. Why did he say bread? Because bread needs the human intervention into it. So God says, all the blessings that only I can give you, all the fruit of the Spirit, joy, peace, love, happiness, reconciliation, I'm going to give you that regardless. But when we say bread, means God, give me today my money. My security and understanding, give me today the things that are manufactured by men. God wants to give you blessings beyond just the fruit of the Spirit. He wants to give you bread, things that are manufactured by men, goods. You're like, I don't, that's not biblical. Yes, it is, is there? You can't get bread. You, you don't find a bread plant. Bread requires a man to create it. We're talking about bread. It's talking about the sustenance that you need. The car that you've been praying for, that's bread. The promotion, that's bread. 
The money, that's bread. And you know what God says? I got daily bread for you. Daily bread. When's the last time you received bread? Can I tell you, can it be that we're not receiving because we stopped asking? How key and amazing that in the Lord's Prayer, when Jesus said, this is how you pray, he included a section where we can ask for material things and not feel like frauds. Because he knows you got needs. He knows that forgiveness doesn't pay the bills. He knows that hope doesn't pay for your children's education. He knows that you need some bread. And what I love about my God, he says, ask me daily, give me today my daily bread. Daily bread? That's not just a word. That's not just hope. That's not just blessing. He's talking about manufactured things. Can I tell you, God has daily bread for you. It's for everybody. And I'm going to close with this. Keep saying that. I have like 10 closes every time. We're committing to this awkward conversation today. Everybody make eye contact with me if you can. We're already here. Let's just go deep, okay? <laughs> Try to make eye contact with everybody. So I'm talking about like your wallet. You take care of this. Like you, you hold this tight. What happens on day like, days like this when, when a pastor talks about money it's, it's the same thing that happens every single time. Those who give, give more, and those who don't give, still don't give. That's what happens. Isn't that wild? Like, have you ever found yourself to be the friend in the friend circle that you always pick up the bill? And I learned something so funny about human nature. We think that generosity begets generosity, when in reality, generosity begets entitlement. I realize that sometimes, you know, Abraham was saying, you know, we went to tacos to speak of holy things, you know. Just, that we just go to TJ to go to TJ. We're praying about you while eating. And he's like, I got this. Can I tell you next time? He's not going to got this. We're going to get this. Why? Because generosity sometimes begets entitlement. So you have to pick it up and say, no, 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 no. I'm not going to be a freeloader. I want to contribute as well. You know what's funny? There's people here in our church that you've never given to the church, and like you're like, oh my God, like the building's still open. Guys, like, it's a bill. If anybody lives around downtown, you know how expensive it is in Little Italy, in downtown, in Bankers Hill to get a like a no bedroom apartment. Imagine this room. Someone pays the bill, and if it's not you, God bless you. Like, love it. No, that's cool. We were still dating, that's cool. God will pick up, he, we're dating. You're like, I don't know, God, I don't know. I'm like, that's fine. But if this is your house, how many of y'all will take a roommate right now that, like, rent free? Oh, dude, just move in. Wi-Fi, I got it. TV, I got it. Oh, yeah, drink my milk, I got it. No, you wouldn't. So what happens in days like this, those who give, you're like, I hear it, pastor, my tithe. If you're not giving 10%, you're not tithing. You're just... You're giving, and that's okay. If you're not there, there. If you're not there yet, that's fine. It took me years. I used to work at a nonprofit at a church, and I would even give my ten percent. I knew they were watching, <laughs> but I'm like, yo, like I just got this car, and like I just can't, you know what I mean? And I was stuck. They never did anything to me. No one can hold you back. But when you tithe, ten percent, it's between you and God. We're never going to be a church that looks at your giving statements and, and treats you and like, no, I don't know what you give. It's there, money comes, we pay the bills. This year we're expanding into that room. We, we already contracted, we're going to have classrooms, we're building out. It's insane. It, 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 our worship songs don't pay the bills. They're nice. Our messages don't pay the bills. No, it doesn't. Who pays the bills? We do. The owners of this house. So I'm going to encourage, Becca, can we put the, the, the push pay thing or one of the graphics? Because I do this twice a year, so might as well commit. Have you ever been like eating sushi and at the end you're like, uh, people put their, their cards and you're like, no, this doesn't make sense. We're going to let this bill go once again. You know what I mean? <laughs> Give you guys an opportunity <laughs> to pay for the edamame that you say you didn't have. <laughs> but you got soy sauce on your cheek. You know what I'm saying? Now, now, this isn't like, I know it's bizarre. I know it's weird. 
this QR code, scan it if you'd like. It's obviously, if you have it already, it's great. This isn't like, we're not picking up a second offering right now. Our church is fine. Don't worry about it. Also, I don't work for this church. I volunteer like you. So my wife and I, like, we go to work, and I'm tired, and I work tonight, you guys. So, okay. We're all in this together, okay? This isn't like, oh, my God, did you see, like, did we pay for that haircut? Nah. Nah, shoot. Nah, I'm good. No, I'm good. We're good. We're good. God's got my family. God's got it. We're paying so that more families can come and find this. Because this is our house. Easter is like a month away, yo. And we're creating space. We're getting a new stage. We're getting all these cool things for the kids. It's going to be amazing. And we don't pay with faith. <laughs> but I want to encourage you today. It's funny. You know, at our church um, today, like, very low attendance because of the time change, because it's so nice. We want to sleep in. I get it. All those cool things. We've been seeing crazy growth in this church. From all the crazy growth... We have 35 recurring givers. 35 people pay for all of this. Imagine if all of us gave something. We would, I want to get to the point where I don't ask for, we don't have a generosity moment. Like, like, you're like, bro, like, dude, what do you mean? Like, you don't have to ask. This is my church. But you weren't responsible because maybe you didn't know the biblical standard, but now you know. And now you know our status. Now we know where we're at. Guys, we have vision for this church. We have vision for this church, more services, more people, more, more opportunities for people to connect. We want to go into the community. We want to reach out. This Easter, we're going to be doing an egg hunt for you and your families. Go into the park, get a bouncer, bring your friends. We're going to have eggs for them. I want to have food for them. Like, like just, just love. But I can't go to the city and be like, I'll pray for you. No, I'll pay the bill. <laughs> no. So we, I just want to imagine if all of us did our part, what would this church look like if we tithe? Are you still with me? Yeah. I want to thank every single one of you. This isn't one of those like services where I'm like, yeah, at the end it's all good. No, no. Ask your pastor if you're here and this is your church. I appreciate every single one of you who gives, who serves, who comes. Oh my God, this church is a miracle. But this is only the beginning. If God did this in less than two years, I cannot wait for the next two years and everything that God does, it's going to be unbelievable. And I want to encourage you, if you've never, if you've never tithe, if you've never given, do it today. Sign up. Whenever is your next pay, they give. Watch and test God. And this, this is what I want you to do. I will challenge you from Pastor Abe to you. Tithe for the next three months. And if your life is worse, come hit me up and be like, yo, can I get my money back? Because it didn't work. I'll give you all the money. I'll look at all the money you gave and I'll give it back to you. Because it's not about your money. I'm not saying go to, go to us and be like, yo, I started giving and my life got worse. Never heard that before. Never heard that in my life. <laughs> Can we stand to our feet? <laughs>